Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the 10th lecture in my series on the gross pathology of the horse. We're going to talk about reproductive disease. We're going to cover some true reproductive diseases and a normal of incidental findings, which I don't want you to mistake for abnormalities, especially when we get to the gravid uterus. As I do at the beginning of my lectures, I want to thank all of my friends and colleagues who provided me these great images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start on the male side of the house because that's much more quickly covered. And we are looking at the shaft of the penis of a horse. If we look closely at the mucosa, you will see that there are a number of raised yellowish white plaques uh, or blisters on the body of the penis. And this is a condition which is caused by equine herpes virus type 3 in the horse. We're going to look at the, the size that it shows in the mare as well. And the disease is called equine coital exanthema. Like other alpha herpes viruses that cause genital lesions, the disease starts out as watery blisters, which quickly rupture and become large ulcers, which in the horse affect the body of the penis rather than the glands of the penis. These lesions will resolve within a few weeks, leaving depigmented spots on the penile body. Like most herpes viral infections, it's likely that this becomes a latent infection. But after the lesions have healed on the stallion, they don't appear to shed the virus again. There is immunity to the virus, but it's short-lived. But evidence from stallions show that recurrence is not likely within a single breeding season. But any of the mares that are bred while the stallion has healing lesions on the penis may contract the disease as well. Another significant lesion that we've already talked about once in the integumentary system on the penis of the horse is squamous cell carcinoma. This malignancy is derived from infection by equine caballus papillomavirus Two, which will cause squamous cell carcinoma on the genital mucosa of uh, female horses as well. The lesions may start out as papillomatous growths and eventually become these ulcerative lesions on the head of the penis. Your differentials for something like this would always include exuberant granulation tissue or summer sores as the flies that transmit uh, habronema may be attracted to the penis because it's in a moist place where they can feed on the secretions. However, when we look at the erosive nature of this particular lesion, squamous cell carcinoma has to be absolutely at the top of the list because the other two lesions tend to be a proliferative growth which would enlarge the head of the penis rather than gnawing away at it like squamous cell carcinoma does. Here's a great picture that you rarely see and this is a condition that is seen after open castrations called scirrus cord or funiculitis. It's often caused by an infection of uh, uh, of the incision site by Staphylococcus. And you may see little granulomas in and around the area of excision. Um, little granules of bacteria surrounded by brightly eosinophilic splendor hopping material surrounded by granulation tissue. This is an interesting lesion. The lesion is called uh, funiculitis. And this is very similar, but uh, the, the granulomas are seen along the testicular artery and vast difference. How this one happened, I'm not exactly sure. Obviously, it wasn't during a castration because you wouldn't see the infection here along the cord. But that's a great word, funiculitis or scirrus cord.
One of the more rare causes of colic in horses is testicular torsion. We don't see a lot of testicular torsion in animal species. Uh, stallions and uh, dogs are just about the only domestic species that get uh, testicular torsion. In the majority of cases, testicular torsion is associated with undescended testes. There is a ligament which attaches the, uh, of the bottom of the testis to the vaginal tunics and to the scrotum, which tends to stabilize it a bit. And if we were going to be absolutely uh, specific in our terminology, this is probably a torsion of the spermatic cord rather than a torsion of the testis proper, but the effect is the same. We have venous infarction of the testis and the epididymis in this uh, animal is probably in significant pain. Well, let's move on to the mare. A lot more things happen to the mare, and especially the gravid mare. So the rest of our lecture, we're going to talk about the female side of the house. I want to start with a developmental abnormality. Um, and we are looking at a female horse with abnormal external genitalia. In this particular case, there is fusion of the vulvar lips and clitoromegaly, and there are a number of things that might cause this. Uh, the best bet is that this would be a male pseudohermaphrodite, a female with an XY karyotype who has uh, testes attached to a very small and poorly developed uterus. There are a lot of variations of this particular uh, condition. It's still a rare congenital abnormality in horses. Here is a uh, foal with presumptively male external genitalia um, with a rudimentary penis, uh, somewhat enlarged mammary gland, and no visible testes. The scrotum is poorly developed. Okay, um, There are conditions in horses uh, which are called or grouped under the uh, uh, name androgen insensitivity, where the testes may not produce testosterone in order to induce the full development of the male gonads, or exterior genitalia at least, or the tissues of the body may be resistant to the effects of androgen and not develop property, properly. Uh, it's not a disorder of the sex chromosomes, and the karyotype of this animal is going to be that of a normal male, XY. You know, there are a lot of images out there, and we could spend a lot of time talking about the intersex. Uh, hermaphrodites, which have both testicular and ovarian tumor, and the pseudohermaphrodites, whose gonads do not match the uh, sex of the external genitalia. Um, I have done a, a little more thorough job in the lectures on the uh, uh, the gross pathology of the reproductive tract, which are also available through the JPC Video Library and YouTube. So I'm going to leave it at that. And let's move on to some infectious diseases of the female reproductive tract in the horse. Okay, we looked at the lesions on the penis of the male horse uh, with equine herpes virus 3 infection. This is what we see uh, in the female horse uh, in animals who have been bred by an infected male and have developed coital exanthema. Uh, you can see that there is ulceration uh, on the perineum, the vulvar lips, and even including the anus and perianal uh, areas. Um, these started out as blisters, they quickly ruptured. These may be secondarily infected by Staphylococcus or Streptococcus, which causes them to become a little worse, uh, exude a mucopurulent discharge. And uh, usually for both sexes, the, the cycle of blister formation, ulcer formation, and ultimately healing is about three to four weeks. Um, 
the ulcers that may be found within the vagina proper tend to heal a little bit uh, more slowly and on both uh, sexes uh, the skin lesions may persist as unpigmented scars for quite a bit of time. Uh, interestingly, uh, pregnancy rates in animals that have been covered and gotten the disease are not reduced. It is really just a, uh, a, a disease which uh, affects the parents. There has been uh, one reported case um, one of the one of the significant considerations in humans with herpes simplex virus 2 is the passage of the uh, uh, fetus through the birth canal. Um, humans tend to have a lot more recurrence of genital lesions due to herpes simplex uh, during times of stress than horses. Remember we talked about that uh, you rarely see it again. Um, but there has been one reported case of uh, a foal who was born to an animal with had been infected and developed corneal disease. And there's been one reported case of reactivation of this condition in a mare following corticosteroid treatment. So recurrence is not all that common in horses. Here's a condition that uh, looks uh, actually more worse uh, more severe than it is. This is a bacterial infection which is called contagious equine metritis and the causative agent is uh, Taylorella equigenitalis. Uh, this is a condition that uh, once again can be transmitted uh, through sexual contact by an infected male uh, to a female and it causes a mucopurulent discharge and mild neutrophilic infection of the vulva, vulva vagina and the uterus. Um, it causes a transient infertility and this type of mucoid discharge which lasts about uh, two to three weeks. Uh, there's no clinical disease in stallions which uh, makes it a little bit difficult um, and they are the principal source of infection as they will mate with numerous mares, so their carrier status may persist for many months or even years. It's a relatively new disease, first diagnosed in the late uh, 70s. There is, a, uh, there is a similar bacterium that affects uh, donkeys called Taylorella asini genitalis. And uh, uh, as we said before, uh, it can be it can persist for months in the urethral fossa and the distal urethra of infected stallions. In mares, it tends to locate in the clitoral fossa, but can also be carried in the uterus, but they carry it for a shorter time than uh, uh, stallions. And as we said before, it uh, may result in an animal not being bred uh, after infection, but they're often bred on the next heat um, and doesn't cause any long-term damage to the uterus. It's a great picture of something that will cause long-term damage to the uterus uh, by Dr. Uh, uh, Paul Stromberg, and we're looking at the horns of the uterus, the long body, of the uterus and of course this is full of pus. This is pyometra. Uh, interestingly hormonal issues are not as important in mares as they are in the dog or the cat and many will even though they have a bacterial infection will continue to cycle through it. Um, in most cases the cervix is fully open and so you don't see a systemic disease. This particular condition is often associated with uh, cervical abnormalities where the cervix is uh, uh, fibrotic, uh, the, uh, it is tilted incorrectly so it uh, uh, may catch some of the fecal matter coming out of the, uh, uh, of the anus uh, or there are adhesions but there's something usually wrong with the cervix 
um, to predispose these animals to uterine infection. Some may uh, have discharge out of the vagina, but many do not. And uh, of course, over time, this will damage the uh, endometrium. You rarely see cases that are this bad, but, but continued bacterial endometritis um, will cause long lasting uh, damage. It is a, a major cause for people to get endometrial biopsies to see if the uh, uh, uterus is still viable to carry a foal or if the chronic infection has resulted in fibrosis that would make it much more difficult. Uh, this is often treated by flushing out uh, the uterus and stilling it with antibiotics. And uh, uh, the most commonly incriminated agents, as you would imagine, would be streptococcus. Uh, strep equi can get there as a result of bastard strangles, but often because it's such a long-lasting infection, what happens is it gets replaced by strep equi variant zooepidemicus, and that's what you get out of it. Uh, as you would expect, uh, animals with cervical problems uh, may get uh, coliform bacteria in there, so E. coli uh, and Pseudomonas have been uh, identified, and also a couple of other less common, like Pasteurella or Actinomyces. It has also been associated with the insertion of foreign objects into the uterus of the mare to uh, uh, for birth control. Uh, interestingly, uh, people used to put marbles in the uterus for birth control, but uh, that's probably, uh, there are drugs that do a better job of that than uh, having a couple marbles rolling around in there and predisposing the animal to endometritis. Here's a disease of the gravid uterus, and, and we will uh, talk about the gravid uterus uh, in a couple minutes, but uh, while we're here, uh, you can see that there is a large amount of hemorrhage uh, along this gravid uterus and this is a rupture of the middle uterine artery. It's usually seen in older mares at parturition and has been associated with low serum copper levels but nobody's ever been able to prove copper is the cause of vascular rupture. It's been associated with aortic rupture in a number of species but uh, it's something that a lot of people will point at but it's really never uh, never been shown. This usually happens at foaling um, or within 48 hours following and obviously uh, is going to be a life-threatening occurrence. This particular uh, presentation is something that you also could see with uh, uh, dystocia or fetal trauma. Sometimes the unfortunately the the foal will uh, because Parturition is such a rapid and violent occurrence in uh, uh, in horses. A foal, especially in an abnormal presentation, may put a foot through the wall of the uterus, resulting in dystocia and usually death of both the foal and its mother. If we move on to the ovaries, oh, this is a fixed specimen. Uh, here is the ovary here. It is very bean-shaped, and, and ovaries of horses are unlike other uh, ovaries of any other species. They are bean-shaped. They're very hard. They is a tremendous amount of smooth muscle, and they have at the, the indentation of the bean or the hilus of the ovary um, is what's known as the ovarian fossa and all of the uh, follicles um, will move toward and ovulate through this fossa. You don't get, unlike dogs and cats, you don't get follicles uh, popping out all over, collected by the fimbria and moved down the track. They all come out in this one area. So the area around that often is a tremendous amount of smooth muscle, which leads a lot of young residents, the first time they get a biopsy of one of these ovaries, they want to call it a leiomyosarcoma. And that's usually just a normal appearance because you have all this fibrous connective tissue and smooth muscle, which serves to funnel all of the ovulating follicles down toward the ovulating fossa where the egg um, will eventually exit the ovary. 
It's usually one egg at a time. Uh, sometimes it's two, but as we see later on, twinning is a, a not a good thing when it comes to horses. But the reason I show you this uh, formalin fixed specimen, here's Fimbria here, is to show you the large number of uh, ovar para ovarian cysts that are not uncommon in horses. Uh, most species, when we talk about ovarian cysts, we're really talking about para ovarian cysts. They're on the outside um, and then uh, uh, they are often uh, remnants of the paramesonephric duct or the mesonephric tubules and they had come they go by a lot of fancy names like the epiooferon um, which often are at the cranial pole of the ovary and the paraooferon which are at the caudal pole of the ovary but I just call them all paraovarian cysts they rarely uh, cause any significant problems the true ovarian cysts which we see um, in very few animals, such as the guinea pig, are the ones that arise within the parenchyma of the ovary. They often arise in the uh, uh, reet ovarii, and as fluid accumulates there, they expand outward and they compress the adjacent functioning ovary, essentially resulting in uh, uh, sterile animals. That's not what happens in the horse. They just accumulate around the outside. They can make palpation very difficult but they usually don't cause any significant pathology of the ovary. Here's a great picture from Dr. John Edwards, which was used in, in this year's Wednesday slide conference, which shows a fairly common uh, uh, incidental finding in older mares, which are often seen during the transition phases uh, of spring and autumn, and these are known as anovulatory hemorrhagic follicles. These are follicles that never ovulate. They become uh, more and more important as the animal gets older. Some people call them transitional follicles. And uh, in older mares, they may represent up to 15% of all ovulations. One of the problems is when they don't ovulate, they sort of sit there. They develop a luteinized wall, and they're very difficult to tell from luteinized cysts, and they're considered um, as a major cause of infertility in uh, older mares. And uh, most recently, they've been advocated as a human model for women's uh, or a model for human, the human condition of unruptured follicle syndrome, which can also cause infertility. Um, there are a lot of theories about how they evolve, um, and no one's really sorted that out. They're usually incidental findings. Nobody ever goes looking for them um, because this animal is old and it's just not cycling correctly, but you can find them in older mares that, that die for a number of other causes, and you just see them as incidental findings. Hemorrhagic and ovulatory follicles. Horses are unusual in that they are just about the only species that can hemorrhage to death simply by ovulating. We're looking at the ovary. There is a large ovarian hematoma from uh, this was a corporate hemorrhagica, but uh, it never walled itself off. It never clotted. And uh, you can see this, uh, usually the uh, hematomas of the ovary following uh, uh, ovulation don't require any treatment. And in most instances, even this bad, the ovary will return to normal function. However, um, there have been a number of cases in which the blood was able to escape from the ovary, the hemorrhage continued, and the animal a developed life-threatening, in some cases, fatal hemorrhage. Very unique to the horse. Well, there is nothing else that looks like this, and this is a slide that is often uh, shows up on certification examinations. And when you look at it, it's just something round with a lot of holes in it and a lot of hemorrhage. And you would think that uh, a lot of things could look like this, but uh, from my early days as a resident, whenever I saw anything that was cystic and hemorrhagic and round until, pro uh, until uh, proven otherwise, that is a granulosis cell tumor of the ovary of the horse. These are, this is a sex cord stromal tumor in the horse. 
um, they often produce testosterone, but granulosa cell tumors can also produce progesterone and estrogen. And uh, uh, these animals may show a range of signs from none to uh, masculinization or nymphomania. So they may want to breed uh, horses. They may act like male horses. So you, they're often recognized by abnormal, intractable, and often uh, sexual behaviors in mares. Uh, mares that have these have a variation in estrus, so they may be anestrus, they may be continually in estrus, or they may have a widely spaced estrus cycle. Um, so they come in for unilateral ovarectomy. We do get a fair number of these as horse submissions. The, uh, the in general, the contralateral ovary is usually small and atrophic as a result of inhibition production by the tumor, which suppresses follicular stimulation hormone. But when you remove the tumor, the other uh, ovary normally comes back to, uh, to full function. So, a uh, granulosa cell tumors. This is one that doesn't usually give you a lot of really nice collectioner bodies. For those of you who like to look at these under the microscope, but the classic, uh, the gross appearance is, is classic for this particular condition. An uncommon tumor of the ovary of uh, just about any species is one that contains hair. And if you are seeing hair on the inside of the body, even if it's a sort of ugly formal and fixed specimen like this, you're probably dealing with a teratoma. Teratomas most commonly uh, arise in the gonads, but they don't have to. Um, they develop from a single germ cell, which has completed its first meiotic division, but not its second. So that's why they usually pop up in the gonads. Interestingly, they can turn up uh, in the adrenal glands and in, in ferrets, which is sort of bizarre. And there is a teratoma-like condition in the uh, uh, at the base of the ear where germ cells proliferate and sometimes form structures like we see here, or even teeth, which is given it the name ear teeth um, by people who have been around horses for a long time. Tissues from uh, ovarian teratomas are diploid, they're XX, um, and it's always fun to get one of these. It can be a, a long and somewhat intricate a description, but remember your histologic description in these tumors, you should be able to identify tissues from at least two of three uh, cell lines belonging to ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And uh, uh, if you have trouble figuring out or, or keeping track of what belongs to where, there's not a lot of endoderm. Um, there is the lining of the gut. Um, and the lining of respiratory, and, and that's about it. And everything else is either ectoderm or mesoderm. Mesoderm being most of your connective tissues, so so fat and bone and cartilage uh, belongs there. And then the ectoderm in these particular cases uh, are often skin uh, with hair and adnexa, uh, nervous tissue, and just about everything else that you will find. Uh, we did talk about uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the uh, penis, and here we have a squamous cell carcinoma of the vulvar lip in a white animal. Uh, today, a lot of these are considered to be the result of infection by equine cabal's papillomavirus. I think that probably the, the fact that this animal also is white um, suggests that UV light might also have had a role to play in the development of this particular tumor. Equine Cabalis papillomavirus has not been recovered from every single one, but it has been recovered in 50 or more percent, both in males and females. So I think that that would be a good answer for cause, but let's not discount um, the effects of uh, carcinogenic effects of uh, UV light. Uh, on the skin where it causes pyrimidine dimers and if the animal has has poor excisional repair then it may end up 
with a squamous cell carcinoma in these particular areas. Well, we're at 30 minutes right now. Let's move on to some things that you might see in the gravid uterus. Um, something that uh, you should know. The, the uterus of the horse is uh, very complete. It generally takes up the entire uterus. It's diffusely attached and as it develops the the uh, the placenta will attach by villi along of the body of the uterus and extend into the uterine horns. There's not a whole lot of room uh, in there and anytime you have a uh, any part of the uterus that has been damaged it won't attach well and one spot that's not normally damaged but if you look at the anterior part of the placenta where it opposes to the cervix you will see that there is no formation of chorionic villi this is known as the cervical star this is the avillus part of the chorion which is adjacent to the cervical os this is a very normal finding and also the place where many placental infections will start in the horse we've talked about the problems that horses may have with their cervix the cervix does not close as tight during pregnancy as it does in most other species and you can get bacterial or even fungal infections which often start at the cervical os um, and infect the placenta in this particular area so when you look at bacterial infections or fungal infections they're often um, most pronounced in and around the area of the cervical star. The cervical star is also where the membranes rupture. Um, there are a couple of other avillus areas of the, uh, the horse placenta. The left horn, you'll have the oviductal papilla where it doesn't attach. On the right, there's a fold over the large allantoic vessels. Um, and anywhere that you might have endometrial cups, which we'll talk about in a minute, you'll have small avillus areas. Otherwise, the placenta is pretty well attached um, to the entire uterus, except for those particular places. Uh, if we look at the placental membranes, which surround the, uh, 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 the fetus, um, this is a condition which is known as amniotic plaques. Um, they usually start to occur at the end of the first to the middle of the trimester. They're incidental findings. They are primarily composed of epithelial cells which are shed from the developing fetus and they sort of flutter down um, to the uh, wall of the amnion or they could get into the allantois and they happily attach and they start growing uh, there. They often will mineralize um, but it's an incidental finding of no particular moment. Another finding that you might see in the uh, allantois, uh, which surrounds the fetus, is usually contains waste products, um, are these allantoic pouches. Um, it is not uncommon to see one or two in just about any uh, group of placental membranes, um, but you may see more if you have changes in venous hydrostatic pressure to the placenta, uh, if the mother has a right-sided heart failure, or if there are torsions of the umbilical cord, anything that increases venous hydrostatic pressure within the placenta itself may form these particular uh, uh, pouches. But seeing one or two is not abnormal. Here's one of my favorite pictures by Dr. Raquel Wretch. When she took this at UGA, she's now at Texas A&M, still taking great pictures. And we can see these allantoic pouches, which we saw before. Two other things that we can see is that cervical star, okay? And then this is uh, a concretion of urinary uh, uh, mucus and stones which may be seen within the uh, allantoic membranes of fetuses and these are known as hippomanes. You can find them throughout uh, pregnancy, sometimes you can find them in the urethras. Um, they tend to vary a little bit in color but they often have a uh, 
sort of yellow orange appearance they have a very interesting layered opinion or uh, appearance when cut so these are hippomanes and and they don't mean anything they're just aggregates of of little crystals and and urinary debris ah here's a little baby and uh, we did mention the endometrial cups endometrial cups um, have a very important function because um, during a particular part of the pregnancy between 40 and 120 days uh, they are responsible they're completely responsible for the production of equine chorionic uh, gonadotropin in the first 40 days the corpus luteum of the ovary in pregnant animals um, provides the progesterone which is needed to uh, for implantation and to maintain pregnancy. After 126 days, the placenta itself, the fetal corin, will take over the production of progesterone. But between the, that 40 to 126 days, um, the endometrial cups um, are required to maintain the ovarian ovarian corpus luteum, the production of progesterone, and the maintenance of pregnancy. Um, the cups uh, are fetal in origin. They develop from the trophoblast of the chorionic girdle. Um, they detach themselves from the chorion uh, after about day 35, and they actually burrow. Remember, trophoblasts like to burrow. They burrow into the uh, endometrial stroma, and they will continue to maintain uh, the progesterone levels uh, until day 120 they become pale uh, and they are usually uh, uh, rejected in a process very similar by graft rejection you end up being surrounded by lymphocytes as we said before uh, at the places where you have the endometrial cups within the, the endometrium there will be a villous parts of the uh, overlying fetal membranes. So these are the uh, endometrial cups, very important in the maintenance of progesterone levels um, between the time of, of the failure of the ovarian uh, luteinized follicle and when the fetal placenta takes over the production itself. If we look at, and we'll finish this lecture with just a couple of infectious diseases we talked about the cervical star and that is generally where most bacterial and fungal infections take place and we're looking at the cervical star right here the anterior part of the uh, placental membranes which are opposed to the uh, os of the cervix and there is a severe fibrinonecrotic membrane uh, around that this is a, a severe bacterial placentitis as we said before, uh, most ascend through a patent cervix. A number of agents, as you would imagine, uh, coliforms uh, are very common, E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, um, Staph, Strep, and Actinobacillus E. coli have all been implicated in, uh, in bacterial placentitis in the mare. As we said before, fungal infections will also come through there. So you would have to consider the possibility of aspergillus infection in this case. And remember, as, as fungal infections tend to be, uh, they really like blood vessels. Here's just a, a fantastic picture of a mycotic placentitis um, due to aspergillus causing thrombosis of the major allantoic vessels. Another condition that uh, uh, gets a lot of play is torsion of the umbilicus. You rarely see torsion, umbilical tortoise, torsion in other species, but in the horse it tends to be very long. And some people say, no, it is never a cause of abortion. Some people say, yes, it is a cause of abortion. Uh, it's been reported in the literature to account for up to 40% of abortions in some studies. Um, people get 
hung up in numbers. I've heard everything from four to five twists to compromise blood flow to seven. Sometimes you can see 11 with no damage. So that is something uh, people that I trust say that you start to compromise blood flow um, after about seven twists. So if you forced me to pick a number, I'd say seven, but I think there are a lot of cases where you get twists and you don't get any compromise at all. So it probably has a lot, there are a lot of factors. I think that uh, umbilical cord torsion probably gets blamed for a lot of fold deaths and, and folds, um, people do get very excited about uh, interuterine death and uh, and did the animal uh, did the animal breathe was it delivered alive or stillborn or aborted because um, there's a tremendous amount of insurance money that gets paid out um, if an animal is not delivered alive but if the animal hits the ground takes a breath it tends to uh, not be paid out so people look very hard for causes of abortion and this is one that a lot of people may fall back on and uh, say yeah it's umbilical torsion in horses twinning is not winning uh, we said before that uh, uh, the normal equine placenta is largely diffusely attached along the body of the uterus and uh, into one or mostly both horns uh, in the case of twins and the ovulation of multiple intact follicles not all that common horses but in the rare case of twins both of them tend to be malnourished there's only so much room for that uh placenta to attach they're both attached at about half of what they normally would be so they are by nature malnourished usually one uh, is attached in a larger area than the other and is slightly less malnourished but you can see that uh, uh, both of these foals are stunted they don't look well nourished and uh, twinning is not winning uh, twinning has been identified as a Core as a cause in up to 30% of abortions, and uh, only about 14% of twin foals will reach the second week of neonatal life. So it's not a good thing to have happen. Uh, a couple of other infectious agents that we see, and we have talked about this early on in the lectures. Um, we are looking at little white foci of necrosis there are little white foci of necrosis in the liver as well as the lungs in this particular one it shows up very nicely it's often obscured by a change we don't really see here and that's significant pulmonary edema often in animals with equine herpes virus type 1 that are aborted you'll see significant uh, pulmonary edema if you look at these lungs underneath the uh, microscope the lungs are hard hit. You have tremendous necrosis of airways. The virus may cause necrosis of endothelial cells and a tremendous outpouring of fluid into the alveoli. Um, so equine herpes virus uh, type 1, a significant cause of uh, abortion of foals, stillborn or weak foals. The mother may show absolutely no clinical signs uh, she may there may be a uh, upper respiratory infection that sort of swept through the barn uh, prior to the onset of abortion um, but the lungs are the hardest hit and that's very common in uh, in herpes viral infection in domestic species you'll see a necrosis and uh, in the liver and spleen about 50 percent of cases here but I always you know, the thing that often jumps out at you is the severe pulmonary edema that you will see grossly in these affected animals. And then just one more, uh, uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, case here of mycotic pneumonia uh, in, an, in a aborted fetus. This animal had one of those ascending infections of uh, fungus and, you know, the hyphae are free in the amniotic fluid the animal is breathing the animal is swallowing this and the animal is able to breathe in some of the uh, uh, fungal hyphae which happily set up shop 
in this particular animal. So uh, a very brief uh, review of uh, reproductive disease and diseases of the gravid uterus. Uh, if you are interested in this, I would recommend that you go to the series on uh, the gross pathology reproductive tract where we look at uh, some of these conditions in a lot more detail. Um, but I think we have just hit the 45 minute mark. So for a lecture series that is uh, dedicated to the horse, 45 minutes on repro is actually pretty good. Uh, Miss Smeagol is here meowing and telling me it is time to cut this one off. So uh, it is Christmas Eve here in Washington, D.C. I wish everybody a fantastic Christmas and uh, a wonderful holiday season for those of you who, who celebrate Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or any of the other uh, religious celebrations of this holiday season. Um, I hope you get the time to spend with family and friends. I look forward to talking to you about the respiratory system in horses tomorrow. Yes, I'll be in here on Christmas Day. My kids won't wake up till probably one or two o'clock in the afternoon. So I got the morning. What am I going to do? Uh, stay home? So we will talk about respiratory tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you come back often to the Foundation's YouTube channel or to uh, the uh, JPC's video library where you can find more lectures on gross pathology of the horse. Have a fantastic holiday.